Good morning. It's a beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful you can be here. It's 9 a.m. and I'm, I'm all ready for my mid-morning nap. I mean, I'm already ready for my nap. So I think I'm starting the coffee too early. I'm starting the coffee. It my, I drink about a pot of coffee, and I, but I'm starting it around 6. So by the time I get here, I'm coming off of the caffeine spike and I'm crashing down. Anyone else coffee drinkers in the morning here? Richard? <laughs> well, it doesn't. My, my sleep issues uh, are, are the reason, but um, yeah, well, I don't have a, a, a cup of coffee here to perk me up at the moment, so probably already had too much this morning, but whether you're caffeinated or not, we're just glad that you're here in a part of class, and I know we still have a few more that will be trickling in here, but... Uh, I want to go ahead and offer a word of prayer and, and get started and might have you, yeah, uh, if you don't mind, Joe, shut that door for us. Thank you. Let's go to our Holy Father in prayer. Great God in heaven, hallowed be your name, Lord. We praise you as your people and we gather in your presence to study your word and to worship you this day. Thank you for redeeming us by the blood of your Son and making us your sons and daughters, for uniting us in Christ, for the fellowship we share, for the peace, for the hope, for the joy that you give us in Christ. Thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us in Jesus and for the grace and the truth that you have manifested to us in Him. And we pray as we go to this great letter, Father, that You have written to us and to all, that our hearts would be open, that we would hear Your voice, Father, and that Your Word would move in us and by it that You might conform us to the image of Your Son, that we might better serve You, that we might ever be, Father, to the praise of the glory of your grace in Christ. Thank you for every precious soul who is here, and bless those who can't be with us this morning, those grieving, those suffering this hour and dealing with heavy burdens, Lord. You know the needs of each one, and, and strengthen our hands to minister to one another, to, to, to be a blessing, the blessing that you would have us to be to each other, and thank you for that, that love that is manifested in the ministry of the saints here and the mutual care that we have for one another, Lord. And we ask your blessing on our teachers. Thank you for the great work that they do in our children, for the good that's being done this hour. And, and on your faithful servants throughout the world as we draw near to your throne with the boldness that you've given us in Christ, may you truly be glorified and may we be edified as our prayer. And it's in the name of Christ, Father, we offer you our thanks and pray that your will be done in all things, now and forever. Amen. Okay, well, <clears throat> I know this uh, study of Romans 14, we're finally in chapter 15, but it's really still part of that same discussion. It's kind of the capstone of all that we've been talking about in chapter 14, and it really ties in, it really leads into the capstone of the whole letter before then Paul has it after that in the, in the end of chapter 15, the latter part of chapter 15 into chapter 16 is really the, the personal remarks of Paul at the end of the letter. So we're coming to the sort of the, I don't know if we'll say climax, but it's the capstone of, uh, I like that term as I have said, of what, we, what Paul has been presenting to us about the righteousness of God and justification through faith in Christ. All of that, you see, we see it coming to uh, a conclusion here. I did want to just go back, though. When I talked last time, when Paul said that, that we need to be careful not for the sake of food, for the sake of our own opinions and our own assertion of our own rights and a disregard for the uh, well-being of our brothers and the unity that we need to strive for in Christ, we could end up destroying the work of God, 
Um, and I said that th that might be the work, the individual Christian is a creation or the work of God or the work that God is doing in his life to redeem him by Christ. But I want to suggest another possibility that fits with the tone and tenor of the letter, the context, which I maybe didn't, didn't uh, articulate very clearly or include, but that is the work that God is doing here to unite Jew and Gentile and to make us one body by, by being consumed with self and not having a proper concern as that, that Paul's been discussing in this context for the opinions and the positions and the sensitivities of others. We could be destroying what God is creating in this new community of believers and the new covenant people. And so that's, think of the work of God in that sense. So I wish I'd have got that in last time, but uh, the, the big picture here, we need to understand, and I'm going to emphasize this in, in the lesson today where I'm going to be preaching about fathers and about God's plan for the family and that this is that it's bigger than myself, that it's bigger than my own desires and my own opinions and my own needs. And so I, we need to keep that perspective in mind, what God is doing in, in the church. And all of that is a part of this. So, so we looked at this bearing with one another. Paul says here he, he sort of summarizes or reiterates what he's been saying by talking about the need to have this sympathetic identification in that great text in 1 Corinthians 9. Remember, that's basically where we left off. But notice this, then. Uh, I, I just hurriedly included, uh, I got really to, to, the, to this statement and the one coming up and just tried to hurriedly include that at the end of class last time. But, but I passed over this. So verse... Look at, the, look at beginning in verse 1 again. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. But this, this cannot be emphasized enough because of how counter it is to the spirit of our age and the trend in our culture to elevate the individual self as supreme. The God of self, I talked about that a lot in Romans 1 in the sermon series that we did on Romans 1 and in class as we looked at that. Um, the idolatry of the self, w that it's not about pleasing ourselves. It's not about that everyone else must bend to and approve of me and whatever I, uh, however I want to express myself or whatever it is that I want, want to do. That's the mentality of our age. And, you know, I keep pointing this out. You probably tire of me making this application, but it's really the cutting edge cultural issue of the moment that manifests this in the transgender ideology and the transgender agenda in the idea that all the girls, for example, competing in sport, that doesn't matter how they feel, how their families feel, that all that matters is that, that man who claims he's a woman and wants to compete in men's sports. So everyone else must capitulate to the feelings and, and put the approval of uh, approval on the individual, right? So forget about what culture, what everyone else in the culture thinks. It's the God of self. It's the autonomy of self in, in the abortion issue. You've heard me talk about that over and over. Uh, it's the, uh, the uh, uh, idea of autonomy or the, the self as supreme, as I've said again and again. But in, and in the idea of putting little girls and women at risk, that men must be allowed who, who say they're women to enter into the locker room with, uh, uh, and, and disrobe in front of uh, girls and women and all that. Why would we ever approve of such an outrageous and obviously offensive and dangerous thing? Because, again, it's about everyone else must approve of whatever it is that that individual is insisting on rather than what about the idea see think of how we model this to the culture it, especially in the midst of the selfishness of our age and this self-centeredness and you remember i did a, a series here in, and i think it was in the gospel meeting i did that led to the door opening for me to be hired here raising cross-centered kids in a self centered culture. 
right? So th think about the way we need to model this to our children, that it isn't all about me and whatever I want, whatever I want to do. That, uh, that it, it, isn't, it isn't about everyone else having to bend to me, but that, that the world is bigger than me and my concerns and what God is doing in the church, right? So this is where we would bring it in to what Paul's talking about in the discussion here. And so it's not about the self and pleasing ourselves that Christ has shown us this is about self-denial, denying the self. If you're going to follow me, you have to, what, what did Christ model to us? To follow him, to be like Christ is to deny self. That's what he did as Paul gets to that here in a moment. That's what I tacked on at the end of class last time about Christ not pleasing himself in verse 3. So the idea of, of, of pleasing your neighbor, um, he says, verse 2, let us uh, each one seek to, to please, please his neighbor, right? Well, that's the love that Paul's been talking about here, right? Keep grabbing the wrong thing to slide in here. A brother or a neighbor? Neighbor. But, uh, like, I think he's intentionally using the word that he used from Leviticus back in chapter 13, 8 through 10, when he said, you know, if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this, love your neighbor, so he's talking about the brothers here, but it's about the proper love for your fellow man. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is about love. So love, the love that Christ manifested, right? Um, Philippians 2, 4, Paul said, look to others before self. He said, count others. Each of you count the other as better than himself. And then what does he say? Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And then that great hymn there in Philippians 2, he talks about how Christ humbled himself and took on the form of a servant and became a man. So he said, this is ultimately demonstrated in Christ. But, um, you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, I don't seek to please myself. I'm seeking the profit of the many that they might be saved. I'm seeking to please all men and all things so that by all means I might save some. That was in that text in 1 Corinthians 9 we looked at near the end of class last time. And if our neighbor happens to be the male transitioning... All right, well, and then, so you remember you brought this up in the last class, and I said we would get to it, and then we didn't get to it, but this is it right here, and bam, look at that, look at that right here. But remember, right, this is balanced by other text where we learn there is a limit to pleasing others, right? And so we did talk about this, and Anna, you brought that up, we, where, where a few verses earlier you talked about th that this makes you acceptable to both God and man, but we can't always please men and please God. Many times pleasing God will offend men, and we see that in Jesus himself, right? He did always the things that are pleasing to God, John 8, 29, but he was hated, he was reviled, he was murdered for pleasing God. So we can't always please God and please our neighbor, right? So there are limits to this. There's a kind of seeking to please men that is a compromise, where you compromise the gospel to accommodate the world. That is sinful. That is the sinful pleasing of men. And that is a, that is a tremendous problem among those who identify as Christian, is wanting the approval of the culture, wanting to be in step with the times, not wanting to be viewed um, negatively by the community. But if you stand for the truth, like you said, what I was just talking about, if you stand for what God says about the family, about the home, about human sexuality, we will be hated and we're, we are not to capitulate to please men in that sense, right? So this does, that point does need to be made. Paul said, if I'm seeking to please men, Galatians 1.10, I would not be a servant of Christ. So there is a context where that, obviously, that would be, be wrong. And Paul talks about not being men pleasers, just with the wrong motive to seek to, uh, uh, to, to please others, right? So, but again, you see how this is modeled, as I said, in Christ. Now, this is, where I, this is what I quickly inserted at the end of class I want to go back to. Uh, here, here. So, society go so wrong, whereas now, if we do stand up for what is right, we're the bad ones. Yeah, well, and, you know, think of the reversal in our culture. The rise of secularism and the abandonment of the Christian worldview, 
what, you know, now, whereas Christianity was once encouraged by our public institutions as essential, even our founding fathers, uh, even some of them who were deists and not strictly Christians, understood the importance of biblical faith and the Christian religion to the welfare of our republic, right? So in history, the Western culture built on the biblical worldview, on the Judeo-Christian perspective, right? As that, uh, as that has been abandoned, see, at first it was viewed as essential. Um, then as it was gradually abandoned with the rise of secularism and all that, there's a big discussion as to why, but um, then it was tolerated. Tolerated, but now it's militantly opposed, where it's not only thought of Christianity, your views and mine, and what the church is to uphold to the world, the truth of God, 1 Timothy 3.15, we're to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now it's not only thought of as wrong, it's not, it's not just that people think it's false and that it's not to be believed, it's thought of as dangerous that it's dangerous and detrimental. You Christians, you see it in the war over the role of parents in public education right now, that Christian parents and, and just parents in general who are coming forward and saying, well, we don't want in public sex education. This is on my mind because it's going to be mentioned in the sermon. But uh, who, who don't want our kids taught uh, ex explicit sexual values in the public classroom that contradict our own values you know, those parents are viewed as a threat. It's not just that we disagree, it's that, and it's not just that you're wrong, it's you're evil to believe what you do and to hold what you do. So I, I think that in the, that's ultimately why we're seeing that hostility is the shift in world views um, has, it, it's incredible to think how far we have come from just a, genera a few generations ago to now, you know, the, this consensus that Christianity is, is hurtful to society, that you Christian fundamentalists are a danger. We're, that's the way we would be pejoratively viewed or termed. Um, because we stand in the way, now here's why, because we stand in the way of this self as supreme and this moral hedonism, this moral relativism and the hedonism and all of that that goes, I, I will go all day on that if I don't stop. So, But notice, because Christ did not please himself, right? So Jesus, we pointed out, is the ultimate demonstration of what Paul's been talking about here all along. Remember in the, in the garden, what did he say? This, is the, this captures so powerfully and profoundly what our whole, yeah, what our whole, what our whole mentality should be. Not my will, but your will be done, right? He said that several times in John, John 5, 36, 38. He came not to do, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And that's when he said, I do always the things that are pleasing to him. Notice he said, Christ didn't please himself. And so the point we were making is that Christ and his, set, Paul brings in Christ and Christ humility and selflessness in suffering on the cross as the model for the way that we should behave in this and in every situation. Patty, yes. Isn't there a difference? Um, I'm sorry, this is new to me, but um, that, that's, no, that's good. Pleasing Christ and taking care of yourself? Well, um, I mean, not taking care of yourself over other people, but just taking care of yourself. And if you don't take care of yourself, then you're not pleasing Christ. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Look at this right here. To please your neighbor, remember, said so that ties back in with what Paul had said back in chapter 13, and the way you treat others, it can be summed up what God requires of us, is to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to have a proper concern for yourself, right? The problem is that's turned into the center of ethics in our day. It's, it's turned into the determining factor, the self as supreme, as I said. But, um, but the other extreme would be to, to have no proper regard for your own self or your own well-being. That's not healthy. That's not right either. Right? Yeah. So, 
um, so th that extreme would be wrong, and I'm glad you asked that question so there's no misunderstanding about that. Um, Self-denial doesn't mean you have no concern for your own well-being. In fact, surrendering self to God is in your ultimate best interest, and that is showing a concern for your own well-being when you seek God's will to be done in your life above all. Yeah? Probably why he said, love your neighbor as yourself, and he did not say, love yourself as your neighbor, because you would treat yourself terribly in that case. Yeah, that, that, that would not be the same thing at all, that, to flip it, right? Uh, so, yeah, good uh, observation. If so think. If we really did that, would we not, would we not stand up? In the schools today, if you're, if you're a Christian and you're a school teacher, uh, you have to allow students to say, uh, I want to be called by such and such. Right, okay. yeah, yeah. And if, if I love myself the way Christ wants me to love myself, uh, I would have to think I would not want to, I would not want to have myself be called by a okay, yeah. now that, pronoun. This brings up another issue, because someone might say, all right, you Christians, you're told to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, well, you wouldn't want someone else to use wrong pronouns for you, right? So if you love your neighbor as yourself, you should use the pronouns they. So if I want to use the pronoun cake and cake self, then every time you refer to me, you have to say cake self or cake. Or yeah, these are, th there, there's a whole list of nutty pronouns that people are now claiming that they insist upon animal names and all that. And so, you know, someone might try to say, well, if you love others as yourself, you wouldn't want other people not to acknowledge your gender. You wouldn't want other people not to acknowledge your choice, let's say, to kill your unborn baby. So, I like that McGarvey correctly pointed this out. The great J.W. McGarvey, one of the great scholars in the Churches of Christ of the, of the 19th and I think early 20th century, but uh, the, the point is when, when we're told to love your neighbor as yourself, it doesn't mean anything a person would want you to do to them. It means in a way that you have a right to expect to be treated, you are to treat others. It, in, in a way that I have a right to expect others to treat me, like the golden rule, Matthew 7, 12, do unto others as you would have um, as you would have other, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that the way you, you often hear it popularly paraphrased, but all things therefore whatsoever you would that men do unto you, do unto them. And someone might say, well then if, if, I, if you would want people to refer to you the way you choose, then you should refer to them the way they choose. All right, well again, the point is uh, I'm, I'm to treat others in a way that I have a right to expect to be treated. I don't have a right to expect people to deny reality, to confirm any delusion that I have. That's, in fact, that's not even loving, to confirm a delusion that I have or a, an intentional defiance of reality to impose, to try to intimidate and impose uh, upon everyone else my own radical and you know untrue perspectives of myself. Not only is that wrong, it's you know it's not healthy for that that person. I don't well, believe. Right there in verse two, let us each take his neighbor for his good. Ah, good. To build him Very up. good. I mean, you have to look at that entire verse. It's not in his own good to you know promote and agree with whatever. That's not for his good, right? Right. Exactly. Right. Right. So, yeah, so people can take that to try to justify, to try to insist you do whatever they please, but, uh, but the, the love that I'm going to have for myself, it, this has to do with what I have a right to expect from others, not anything I demand from others. Too so. many people start to think it is for their good because they think, oh, I need this for my own self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you have long hair when you were young? <laughs> uh, w I'm wistfully thinking of the days of my luscious, uh, glorious head of hair that I had. Yeah, well. Did anyone ever mistakenly refer to you as a 
When I was really little, when I was a baby, my people would tell my mother I could be all dressed in blue, head to toe, and they'd say, oh, what a beautiful little girl. My brother had very long hair, okay, and he kept that long hair for a long time. But I remember on maybe two occasions, someone mis mistook me, which my hair wasn't that long compared to his, but they mistook me for a woman because my voice hadn't changed yet. And so, boy, I was very upset. Yeah. I would change something about my look so that that wouldn't happen again. <laughs> but, you know, nowadays, it's uh, not yeah. the same. Yeah, well, yeah, so now we're supposed to affirm every, every delusion and every perversion that anyone wants to assert for himself. And, and if you don't, you're a bigot and you're a bad person. We're, but we can say, as Leanne has pointed out, that's not for anyone's good. Right. Even though they might claim that's what they want, that's not what's in anyone's best interest, including the person insisting that everyone do it. Richard? Uh, our grandpas may not have had a college education, but they had something called common sense. Yeah, well. This nation is getting away. Yeah. I mean, until 20 minutes ago in all of human history, you didn't have to point out that there are only two genders, that everyone's either male or female, right? This insanity of this moment is a direct result of abandoning the biblical understanding of ourselves. Once you say the self completely determines his own morality and his own identity, this is the nonsense that you end up with, that our grandparents would be scratching their head. Imagine if you go back in time a couple of generations and talk about some of this stuff. They'd, they would be, what? They, it, would, it would make no sense. It's as foolish and ignorant as the idolatry that we think was so pitiful and then people fall down before an object they created and said, here's my God, deliver me. Uh, we think that's foolish and we think that's ridiculous, but uh, the idolatry of the self is every bit as ignorant and foolish and dangerous as any kind of rank, crass idolatry that any pagans have ever engaged in or are engaging in now. Yeah. Didn't he so beautifully introduce the 15th chapter telling us many things in the very first verse that sometimes we get over that and we go back to the goody stuff. But he says, he's speaking to strong Christians uh, and that we have an obligation. But he said, to bear with the failings of the weak. So those are failings that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, things that the homo, whatever they do, and all this stuff, and what they think, and what you call them. That's well, the yeah, the failings in this context and the bearing with are, are showing sensitivity toward people's own, in, a view that Paul says is incorrect here. Eating, it's, it's correct to eat meat. Now, it's, it's fine, it's perfectly right and acceptable to forego eating meat. But Paul says it is right to eat meat. It is acceptable to eat meat. We know that. Uh, so he's calling that misunderstanding or that weakness in conscience a failing that we should bear with. But uh, this kind of stuff that people are saying, uh, we shouldn't bear with, um, pe again, people's delusions that are harmful, affirming delusion and denying reality. I mean, what, how is Jesus identified in John 14, 6? This really strikes at the very character of God himself. He is the way the truth. God is the ultimate source of truth. Christ is the, is the personal manifestation of truth. To, to play along with the gender dysphoria delusion is to deny truth and fundamental reality as God has constructed it. And so ultimately it's blasphemous. Now I might, I might, I could conceive perhaps in a certain situation where you might show sensitivity to someone with gender dysphoria and uh, about using the pronouns that they choose. You're trying to study the Bible with a family and their child is identifying, their daughter is identifying as a boy and wants to be called he or whatever. And so you might try to tiptoe through that carefully and show some sensitivity to it. I mean, in the cultural level where you say, um, if you refuse, like the teacher who was fired because he wouldn't use the gender pronouns for the student that the student was insisting that the teacher use. Now he was fired, but then later he, he, uh, he sued and later he, he was reinstated. But you see that, that cost him a tremendous amount of trauma and stress and money 
And think of the harassment then that it was to him. So eventually, you know what, it's not going to be worth it to people. And they'll just move on and find a job somewhere else. And then we'll just shrink back like cowards who don't want to bear the price of being bold and insisting on uh, being faithful to the truth. And, and then so by default, the secular view and the radicalism of the left takes over. That's what that, that by sheer intimidation and sheer moral cowardice. So cowardice. But I'm kind of getting off the track here. But so I want to this idea of Christ being at the heart of Christian ethics. I love pointing this out um, and uh, that in thinking of examples in the Bible and teaching and preaching on this. Think of how what Jesus did in denying himself to the point, Philippians 2, to the point of to the point of suffering humiliation and death on the cross. That's what Philippians 2 is talking about. Have this same mind in you that was in Christ. And then he talks about how Christ was God in the form of God, but he humbled himself and he took on this, a form of a servant and he was found in fashion as a man and he became obedient even to death, the death of the cross. All right, so Paul there is using what Jesus did as a model for unity. Can you think of other places where the self-sacrifice and the suffering of Jesus is used as a model for ethical behavior? I'll give you an example. For marriage, right? The way I'm supposed to love my wife, Paul said. How, do I, how should I strive to love my wife? Christ loved the church. Right. The, and how did Christ love the church? Paul says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives. Wise as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, right? By what he did on the cross, he demonstrated how he loves the church. So I'm to demonstrate that in the way that I treat my wife. In enduring suffering, right? Uh, unjust suffering, especially, um, Paul, we're told to um, follow Christ's steps, uh, 1 uh, Peter 2 in verse 21 Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. So it's an example of being faithful to God, even if we have to suffer. What we've been saying here and what Paul has said all along, it's, it's the model for self-denial and putting the well-being of others above self, the glory of God above selfish. Now, like Patty pointed out, you are ultimately seeking what's in the best interest of yourself when you surrender to God. That's the irony here. Self-denial leads to the ultimate and only true self-fulfillment. Uh, John 12, 25, Matthew 6, 24, and other passages, Matthew 16, rather, 24 and 25. But th that self-denial, uh, Jesus is the model for that. Remember, for love for one another, what did Jesus say? Love one another even as I have loved you. And in that context, in that upper room discourse, he says he, he gave the ultimate love. There's no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. So what Jesus did on the cross, he's saying, love each other that way, the way I'm loving you. So you see how the cross needs to be. That's why in our preaching and teaching, we, we need to constantly emphasize the attributes of God, the character of God, what the narrative, what the text is telling us about who God is and what he's done in Christ, because that shapes who we are, how we're to live. It's the basis of how we are to live, right? So I, I love teaching on ethics and, uh, from, and from that perspective especially. But now he's going to bring in scripture here. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written. Now we cite Psalm 69, this text. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So Jesus, in other words, didn't please himself to the point where he was willing to be hated. People who hated God were reproaching him, condemning him, reviling him. Why? Because he loved God because he was being faithful to God. Well, who? Well, in this psalm, now this psalm is quite significant. After uh, Psalm 2 and 22 and Psalm 110, which is the most cited text in all Scripture, uh, this is one of the most cited psalms in the New Testament. Uh, it's cited a number of times here. I'm just going to bring these in actually here. 
And here's what's remarkable about this. As you look at these citations here, when you read Psalm 69, how can Paul take this psalm and say, this was written about Jesus? It's, this psalm is a psalm of lament. It's, it's a cry of distress. It's a righteous sufferer, and he's being persecuted, and he's complaining to God. He's crying out to God in his suffering, and, and it's an imprecation that he's calling for God's punishment on his enemies. He's calling for God to judge his enemies, to hold them accountable, and to step in and deliver him. Now, the point is, when you read a psalm like that, if you were a Jew, you would hardly read that text and think, that's talking about our coming Messiah. That's talking about the one who, whom God is going to send to conquer and deliver us. You would never look at that that way, you see. But of course, Christ, and what God has done in Christ, you see, it completely reorients your whole thinking about the whole role of the Messiah. And uh, the church then was able to see it as representative of Christ's suffering. Jesus, it's about a righteous sufferer crying out to God. Well, Jesus is the ultimate righteous sufferer. In fact, the only true, ultimately righteous, perfectly righteous sufferer. So he's the righteous sufferer par excellence. So what it is, is it's, an, it's a typological interpretation. Remember, now we need to read and reread the whole Hebrew Bible, the, the Hebrew scriptures in light of Christ, right? Jesus taught that himself in Luke 24, as I pointed out over and over again in the, in the introduction to the Gospels class and in the Acts class. So we need to re read the Bible Christologically or in view of Christ. So when you look at the Psalm, see where it's cited in the New Testament. More in number, Psalm 69, verse 4, he starts out crying out, he starts out talking about how he's crying out in distress. But then he says, more in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without a cause. That's cited by Jesus in John 15, 25. Uh, you remember when Jesus, when Jesus cleansed the temple, when he made a whip and he overturned the tables of the money changers and he drove them out of the temple. The disciples, you know, their jaws dropped, essentially. Their eyes uh, were wide open and they, you know, from their reaction, you could almost see them. They saw what Jesus did there and they thought of this psalm. They knew their Bibles because there, John says, they, they thought of the, the passage, zeal for your house has consumed me. So the righteous sufferer is saying, I'm so zealous for you. I'm consumed with zeal for you. And here's the text Paul cites here, the, the latter part of that verse. I'm so consumed in my zeal for you that people who hate you are hating me. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. The, the reference to an acceptable time is alluded to by Paul in 2 Corinthians 6 too. If, it, if not an outright citation, I have it underlined rather than highlighted. It's alluded to there. But notice it's talking about God's steadfast love. He's appealing to God's saving faithfulness. What about this? They gave me poison for food. He's complaining about how he's being persecuted. And for thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. So he's talking about how contemptuously they treated him. There, there you have an allusion to the suffering of Jesus on the cross. And then in Romans 11, we've already seen Paul cites this part where this is the imprecation. This is where he's praying, let their table become a snare. Now, this is a Jew. This is David, uh, and he's asking for God to do this to his enemies, but it could be it's God's own people. It's God's own people who are persecuting him. Because, because Paul cites this about the Jews. Let their own table before them become a snare. When they are at peace, let it be a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Make their loins tremble continually. So that's a prayer uh, for um, deliverance and for judgment, for justice. And then Acts 1.20 cites the, this verse 25, uh, let, may there can't be a desolation, let no one dwell in their tents, about Judas, about the betrayal of Judas against uh, Christ. But how does it fit here then? How does all that fit here then? Well, it's the idea that Jesus was willing to surrender himself and seek the well-being of others, even to the point of being reproached, to being condemned, to being... We have to be willing to be hated. We have to be willing to suffer and sacrifice 
even or we have to be willing to to deny self even to the point of suffering even if it requires great sacrifice great hardship is the idea that's what jesus did paul says my concern for your well-being should be so great that i'm willing even to uh, endure the great hardship um, if, if that's what it takes, if, if that's what surrendering my own interest for your spiritual well-being, for the good of the unity of the body of Christ and the work of God and the work that God is doing in Christ, then, then so be it. I'm following the example of Christ our Lord. And so he cites the scriptures and he's showing you, see, we can read these scriptures and apply them to ourselves, right? Because he says, uh, verse 4, for whatever was written in the former days was written for us. It was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, notice he uses that word scriptures of the Old Testament text as we think of it. Through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Paul keeps bringing up hope. It's a recurring theme and emphasis here in Romans. But notice here, whatever was written in the former days here, verse 4, that's talking about the Hebrew Bible. And he calls, it, he calls it the scriptures, right? Now, the reason that's important, you remember the passage we often cite about the all-sufficiency of scripture to lead us and to inform us to know God's will and all that we need to know and do to please God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete completely furnished for every good work. We should all have that verse memorized, and you've heard it over and over in sermons, no doubt. But uh, when he says all Scripture, he's writing to Timothy, and he's alluding to the Old Testament text, right? That's the Scripture Timothy would have had and been familiar with. But Paul himself, in writing that, was adding to Scripture, right? And I'm citing here, Peter also speaks of the Scriptures coming by the Holy Spirit, the Hebrew Bible. But in chapter uh, in 2 Peter 3, he refers to what Paul writes as Scripture. So that term is very important. The New Testament writings are also Scripture, a part of God, God's revelation. But this idea, they're written for our instruction. Yes, those Old Testament stories. Yes, these affirmations in the Old Testament text. Uh, back in chapter 4, I have, I have a, uh, several of the references here. Look, uh, these references that I've got right there, look. Chapter 4, when he was talking about Abraham, he says, verse 23, but, but the words, it was counted unto him, he's citing Genesis, they were not written for his sake only. God wrote that down when, God's, when we're told that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. We're told that was written for us. That was written for us who believe. Right? Look at 1 Corinthians 9. I love this one. This one's almost humorous to me. Because he says, uh, verse, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9, he quotes Scripture, For it's written, and he quotes Deuteronomy, In the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the grain. What does that have to do with what Paul's talking about there? He's talking about preachers have a right to be supported by those to whom they preach. What does that have to do with an animal? You're not to muzzle him out if he's treading on the, on the corn to crush it, to make meal, uh, you're not to put a muzzle on him so he can't eat of the work that he's doing. But I love this right here. He says, now, why did God say that? Is it, is it for the oxen that he's concerned? Now, it's not that we shouldn't have a proper concern about treating animals ethically. But God didn't say that so much because he cared about, not so much because he cared about the ox. It was, it was for our sake. It was our sake. Uh, so that we would so that we would have hope of sharing in our labor. So, but then in this, when Paul in First Corinthians ten, when Paul catalogs the failures of the Israelites in the wilderness, and he says, "Look at verse six. These things took place. They're examples for us." And then I've truncated the text here, but down in, in verse eleven, these things, as he talked about how they committed fornication and idolatry, these things, you see it right here. They were written down. For our instruction, for our instruction, what, what conclusion does he want us to reach? So let anyone who thinks he stands takes heed lest he fall. So all that we read in the Old Testament scriptures, all of this 
This was all written for us. And Paul says it's for our encouragement. It's for we will endure so that we will hold on, so that we will know we can trust in God and that our hope will be realized. And that hope is what he has been talking about. We're saved by that hope. We're to abound in that hope, chapter 15 and verse 13. We're, this is the whole point of everything that God has done for us in Christ. The, the hope of it finally being consummated and fully brought to pass and realized when Christ comes. That is what we are hoping for. And when I read about what God has done in Scripture and I see how He's true to His promises, when I see the character of God and the work of God, I can realize that God is speaking to me. Read the Bible with regard for the context to whom a particular text was originally written, but then remember, it was written for you. For you. God is speaking to you because He wants you to have that endure. Endurance, he wants you to endure and have that encouragement and have that hope. Isn't that a great text? We quote this verse a lot too, don't we? I used to hear it quoted a lot, right? And we should, we should. So uh, once again, the battle continues to get through this context. But uh, there was some interesting discussion that came up this morning about some of these related issues about the, the self and pleasing self and the limits of that, please, the limits of pleasing neighbor. So I'm glad some of those things came up. And I appreciate, you know, the, the thoughts that we were able to share along those lines. Now, God bless you this morning. Got time for a quick nap before worship? Get to the office. Or a cup of coffee. Who's going to Starbucks? <laughs>